Here to discuss are Timothy Snyder, history professor at Yale University. He has a newsletter on Substack called Thinking About, and his books include On Tyranny. Also with us is Basil Smeichel. He's a Democratic strategist and an adjunct assistant professor of education at Columbia University's Teachers College. Tim, I'm going to start with you. You wrote the, that the war on history really is a war on democracy. Lay out for us how not teaching the truth about American history is a threat to our democracy. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is, this is true for Americans. It's true for everybody else. Democracy is always about the past, the present, and the future. We have to have a, a history that we can all have access to, which is fair to us all and which is true, so that we can bear individual responsibility for the future. In order for a democracy to work, there have to be a lot of uncomfortable truths in the picture. Part of growing up is realizing that the myths and the fables and the things that we find easy to deal with don't always correspond to the past. If we don't have uncomfortable truths in our curriculum, then we don't grow up. We don't grow up as individuals, we don't grow up as citizens, and we're not capable of making tough decisions. If what our classroom gives us is the stuff that makes us feel good, we're being groomed for authoritarianism. If our teachers are forced into a position where all they can do is tell us that we oughtn't to feel bad about ourselves, we're gonna get used to that, we're gonna be spoiled by that, we're never gonna see ourselves as a nation, we'll just see ourselves, this is my white we now, as a tribe. Mm. Mm. And Basil, what's, what's the political angle here, right? I mean, if, if they're grooming us for authoritarianism, which is a scary phrase, um, why, why are Republicans doing that? Why are they pushing this issue so hard uh, in, among their base? And why are white, white parents buying into it? Well, I'll start from the uh, comments you made at the top of this segment, which is that critical race theory is, number one, it's at least 40 years old. Uh, it's something that as a college student or a college professor, you'd be um, inclined or you'd be more likely to hear and study. Um, so if you put all, if you put that together with, say, over the last few years, going back 2017, 2018, this plethora of affirmative action cases that was sort of bubbling up, if you add that to the 28 plus uh, pieces of legislation that have been introduced lately to uh, limit uh, voter access that disproportionately impacts people of color. What you see is this sort of larger effort mm -hmm. to circumscribe Black economic and political power and thought leadership. And that's incredibly important, particularly as when you look at K-12 education, there are a lot of school districts that have taken civics out of the classroom. And if you're not studying the, 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 the real history, the more uh, 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 the larger history of uh, of what it means to be in America or an American, uh, then what you're then what you are doing is really limiting um, the access to information for uh, certain populations in this country, and that clearly has an, uh, the effect of empowering one over the other. And so, this is not just about critical race theory. This is a long term more pervasive effort at limiting economic and political power for certain populations, particularly black populations in this country. And quite frankly, it's folks throwing a lot against the wall, seeing what sticks, and using that as a wedge as we get into 2022 midterms and certainly the, the uh, presidential in 2024. I want to take some of that and, Tim, ask you a related question. So in a lot of ways, I think the big lie is based on the fact that there was higher turnout for those communities of color um, that had been as accessing more political power through the ballot box, through running for office, through electing people that look like the squad. Um, and, you know, they, they turned Georgia red, uh, blue. They turned Arizona blue. Um, the lie that Trump has been telling up through January 6th and the insurrection, it seems to me like uh, there's a dark history um, connected to uh, the fact that they're lying on the basis of people of color exercising political power. So unpack um, how the big lie is connected to increased turnout among communities of color. Well, I, I think you and, and Basil also has, has made a very important connection between 
um, these new memory laws and, and voter turnout and, and voter suppression. The, the big lie itself, that is Trump's claim that he won the election, is itself proof that there is something like systemic racism in the United States. I mean, the man only has to sort of gesture at cities and refer to fraud. And everybody, black or white, in this whole country knows what he is saying, right? Some folks feel the threat and some folks find the opportunity. And the way the opportunity is pursued, as Basil has already said, is by way of voter suppression. What I would like to do is show how the voter suppression laws are connected directly to these memory laws. What these memory laws do is they make it impossible to create a curricular situation where white students would feel ashamed or guilty. But our history of voter suppression is shameful. Some of these, what some of these measures do, like the one in Florida, is they say that it's, it's impossible to teach that racism is systemic, that voter suppression is precisely part of the system. So what these memory laws are doing is they're basically paving the way for, they're legitimating the voter suppression. They're, they're creating a kind of aura of innocence around the voter suppression. They're trying to do away with the history, which could help us to understand how voter suppression works. It's such, such so important to understand all of that. And Basil, uh, I, I want to turn to the topic of Nicole Hannah-Jones, which is is related to this conversation, because yeah. what's happened to her uh, at UNC, uh, turns out they're now offering her tenure. But that wasn't after a whole brouhaha. Um, so she she actually is like, I don't know if I'm going to take it, your tenure, uh, UNC. What's your reaction to all that's happened here? Um, it's been fascinating, but also very frustrating. Well, I could start by just trying to start the conversation about, number one, the number of Black folks that have doctorates in this country and their ability to get mm -hmm. tenure at universities which is another topic for another day that is uh, quite extensive <laughs> and I'm sure a lot of folks can discuss. But the, the truth is what it, all, what it shows, which dovetails to our previous conversation, is the role that moneyed interests have in, in, in stifling or encouraging, but in this case, stifling voice. You see that with, in the way that this particular, a, a particular donor um, to the university um, held up uh, her uh, tenure uh, acceptance or, or tenure offer. Um, we see in other university settings the very strict path towards tenure that professors have, and that in some cases, and there was a, a, a report some weeks ago, months ago, about a professor, a professor, and pardon me for forgetting where he was from, that did not get tenure, and in many ways it was because of the, this view about the the, the journals that he published in that weren't seen as sort of mainstream. And there are a lot of these code words, there are a lot of these uh, uh, opportunities to, to limit discussion on campuses. But, and one of the ways to do that is through this tenure process where you give professors of color, particularly black professors, the safe space to really talk about issues in a mm -hmm. way that they should be discussed. Hi, I'm Zerlina Maxwell. Thanks for checking out our channel on YouTube. You can see more from Zerlina by clicking any of the videos on this screen and make sure you subscribe below to stay up to date on the day's biggest stories. Thanks for watching.